Gary Matsuoka, this is Laguna Hills Nursery. We're, we're making them. Nancy, we have more handouts printing right now. All right, we'll start again. <laughs> All right, uh, this is Laguna Hills Nursery in Santa Ana, and today's topic is uh, growing avocado trees. Now, we don't carry that much this time here. We're getting our biggest shipment in in spring. Our supplier um, determines when the weather is right to do it. So all I have are a few that we grew this year. I mean, we did grow quite a few avocados and sold them this year. This year we did about uh, 700. I mean, we're, we are starting, that's, because we can't grow citrus, can't carry citrus this at this moment in this part of Orange County, we're uh, concentrating more on avocados, which are considered one of the more difficult fruit trees, or it's probably the most difficult tree crop to grow. Uh, but it shouldn't be that hard. I mean, if you drive around the neighborhoods here, there is plenty of really old avocado trees in the ground, you know, 60, 70 year old trees. Uh, we're having trouble with the newer ones because the growers in the last 20, 30 years have been instructed to grow them improperly, especially the growers who sell to retail stores. So we buy our old trees from Brokaw, which is the largest supplier of avocados in California commercially. They grow, oh, probably 300, 400,000 a year. So they do a lot, and they might do more than that, but we know they do uh, 250,000 of one variety. So we know they do a lot of avocado trees. Um, and generally we consider them as easy as more, most plants when they're grown properly, either by Brokaw or by ourselves. And I don't have anything at the moment here that Brokaw grew to the size. We've taken uh, plants from Brokaw and grow them, and grow them bigger. That's what we're doing. They gra do the grafting and then we grow the plants to um, a larger size for retail. So the thing about avocado trees, number one, they do not like compost near the roots, in the root zone. And that's the biggest problem we're having. If you've been to our soil classes, we talk about it all the time. Compost does not belong in the dirt. It belongs, dead, dead leaves, dead stuff, dead stuff in general belongs on top of the ground, uh, away from the root system. And the soil where the roots are should be just pure soil, which is pretty much 99% mineral, sand sold clay. So if you plant an avocado in sand, soil, or clay, uh, and you've got a, well, and especially if you have good drainage, there's no way you can kill that plant by overwatering. Whereas if you get an avocado from a retail, normal retail supplier that's growing in, you know, one of them grows them in 75% sawdust, another one it's like 40 to 50% wood shavings, uh, another one grows them in, well, another one grows them 75% sawdust too. So if you get them from those companies, you have to, they'll, they'll tell, you know, they'll tell you, don't water this too much. You have to let it get dry between waterings. Um, you know, just be careful how, you know, just really hold back on the water. Whereas, you know, avocado trees native to Guatemala, West Indies, Me uh, Eastern Mexico, you know, talking about 80 inches, 90 inches of rain every year. It rains virtually, I mean, it's virtually wet all the time. And the other thing that most people have done that is contradictory is that most people have taken an avocado pit, put in a glass of water, and watch it grow. There's no issues there. They can, I've seen people have that in the same glass of water for three years. And there's no drainage in there. They never get dry, and they're perfectly healthy. So the key is... Um, well, the key is the, the type of the water itself. If the water has enough oxygen in it, the roots will not suffocate. So water from the tap, if you open up your tap, get the water out, the amount of oxygen there is five to seven parts per million. That's because the, or it's actually six to eight parts per million, and that's because the water districts have to do that. They know they have to keep the oxygen level high in the water so that when someone sprinkles your yard, it doesn't kill the plants. If the water doesn't have any oxygen in it, the roots do suffocate. But as long as your water has that oxygen in there, 
you're fine. Now, what takes the oxygen out of the water? Dead stuff in the water. If there's dead things in the water, and people of ponds know this, if you throw a bunch of compost in your pond, all the fish and all the plants die within a few days. It's because there's so much decomposition going on in that compost. You know, there's no such thing as finished compost. People keep telling me, oh, I use finished compost. Finished compost is carbon dioxide and water. So if you throw anything that has substance in a pond that's dead and ground up real fine like that, the oxygen is gone really quick because it's decomposing too fast for the water to replenish its oxygen from the surface. And then the water looks like a sewer after a few days and everything tends to die off. And the same thing happens to avocado roots. If you've got dead stuff mixed into the dirt around the roots, um, too much of it and it stays wet too long, then the oxygen level drops too low, the avocados start rotting. The roots suffocate first. Uh, they start turning paler, more yellow. Um, advanced case would be you start losing all your lower leaves. All you have are leaves at the tips of the branches and they're real small. Small leaves usually means no roots left. So the size of the leaves and the color of them has a lot to do with how much Usually, too, they get brown tipped on the tips because they're not pulling, the roots cannot pull any water up at all. Now, this tree has got like this from the Santa Anas. So, uh, when it's getting whipped by wind and we're not there watering it several times a day, it gets a little bit dry. You can see the newer foliage that came out after the Santa Anas is fine. Actually, this is probably summer, summer damage. Um, in our growing ground that I am supposed to be watering, you won't see that. Here at the nursery I have other people watering for me, well, you know, they don't get quite get to it sometimes. So all these plants were underneath my care and they're all, you know, they're all quite perfect. So, but we do water them virtually every day it's above 80 degrees. If it's less than 80 it's not as critical. Right now, you know, if you water them once every, well, you may not have to water anything in your garden in the ground until until late spring at this rate if the rain keeps up. So when the, at this temperature they don't, they, don't, they don't use much water at all or any water really. Now the avocados, just so you know, they're, um, they do start freezing at about 27, 26. Usually we don't see any damage if it just stays a few hours at like 26 degrees. But uh, we learned our lesson back in 1990 when we hit 23 degrees for about five or six hours, two days in a row. Um, most of our avocados froze, totally froze. I mean, everything above ground just turned black and it was gone. So we threw away a lot of avocado, young avocados that year. Now, if the trunks are this big, they're pretty much safe as far as uh, keeping the tree alive, but still you lose a lot of branches and leaves at that temperature. So 23 degrees is too cold. I don't know if we'll ever see that again in our lifetime, but we may. Uh, all it takes is a, um, you know, like this jet stream came directly down from Canada to here, and you get another one of those in a month, it may be a lot colder. So, and in fact, this weather does remind me of the late 80s when we had some really cold winters where it gets cold before Christmas. I mean, we may get all our chill we need for our stone fruit trees before Christmas this year, because at this rate, we're getting about 100 hours a week of chill. Uh, so we may do it right before Christmas. Okay, um, so avocados. The avocado belt in California includes all the foothills in Orange County. So they consider the foothills uh, with the better air drainage. So on a hill, the reason why they like the foothills is if you have, especially if you have a river, the cold air in the wintertime, which is the most dangerous things for avocado trees, the air is colder the higher you get. It's like uh, half a degree every 100 foot you go straight up just because the air is thinner. Thinner air is colder. But cold air sinks. Cold air is heavier than warm air, so all the cold air on the hills tends to drop toward the riverbed. So if you live near a culvert or a river, like Santa Ana River is really cold in the winter, these are the cold spots. If you live in Tribuco Canyon, that really gets cold. 
I mean, I had some customers tell me they already hit below 20 degrees this year up in Tribuco Canyon, so that's a bad place. But the hills up here are about as warm as you can get. So most avocado trees are grown on the sides of these hills that surround Orange County. Um, of course, you know, we're not that cold a climate. For the last 50, 60 years, we haven't been too cold just to grow them on the flat ground. But watch, if you're in a little low area, you can run into trouble. So be careful with that. Now, we have the technology to keep our trees warm. You just, you know, you get a halogen light, shine it on there all night long. It'll keep that thing pretty toasty. Or uh, you can wrap the trunk with bubble wrap. Or you can, you know, you can put a lot of containers filled with water around it. That keeps it warm, too. So there's a lot of things you can do to keep the trees warmer on if we do have a frost. Okay, and we, and generally too, if an avocado tree, we see a lot of things on the internet where trees are burning up. Um, everybody says you've got to cover the, you know, shade the trees to keep them from burning. Now, generally, if you have a healthy avocado tree, like if you get one from us, it'll won't burn in the sun unless we get close to 110 degrees. We found if you buy it from a regular retail supplier, you hit 95, they burn up. So the healthier the root system is, the better they can bring the water up and cool off the leaves, the more heat they can take. We never thought the trees we got from Brokaw would ever burn until 2010 when we hit, when you got, first time we ever seen it above 110. It's 112 and all my trees are burning. Uh, so he said, okay, we have to whitewash these if they predict that weather. This year we didn't get close, but last year, of course, we did 114, 115. That was nasty. I mean, most of our little avocado trees that were about this size in July of last year, was July, what was it, July 6th, I believe. We lost the top foot of them. They just turned black, even though we were watering them, just sprinkling overhead with that kind of heat. You couldn't do much about it, so we lost the top foot. But the weather stayed quite warm, which avocados like. They like it in the 90s. So the tops regrew within two months. You couldn't tell there was any damage by the end of summer. Uh, although we know that in the orchards in the area, they lost half their crop. The fruit just burned off the trees. So whenever you get a much above 110, you can't do much about that. I mean, unless you have a, you know, spent, you have a lot of technology out there, some misters going misters blowing like they do on football fields. So, so anyway, uh, temperature-wise, we're generally pretty good around here. Um, they need good drainage. Good drainage does mean that if you dig a hole where you're going to plant your avocado, about a foot by a foot, fill with water, if it drains out within 15 minutes, you've got great drainage. Uh, within two hours, you're doing okay. If it takes two days to drain, that's a bad spot. Uh, now, in my backyard, my last house I lived at, we planted avocados back there, and we had soil that was like concrete. I mean, the, a friend of mine who was the geologist for our tract told me that they did that on purpose. They don't want the ground to absorb any water when they're that close to a, a drop-off on the side of a hill. That's a new technology back in the late 80s, so they didn't want hills to slide anymore. So. They said, even though my front yard was sand, the backyard, they said they put two foot of clay and really packed it down. So, I mean, you can chip at it a little bit. That was about all you can do. So we just, so what we did, instead of digging a hole in the ground, so we had a flat area. Um, I brought in two pickup loads. That's two scoops of sandy loam from a uh, building supply in the area. Um, and just put them on the ground here. So sandy loam is, is the natural soil that a farmer would want. It's mostly sand, a little bit of clay, a little bit of silt, but there's a lot of sand in there. And we made a hill that was about 18 inches high and two truckloads got us about eight foot across. Now Brokaw, who does a lot of you know, orchard planting, they said four foot wide is enough. They have the farmers do something that looks like this. 
four foot wide and about 18 inches high. So they, when they are putting the fields down, they'll tell them to build up berms that are about 18 inches. So they can get, essentially what they're doing is getting the entire root system of the plant above ground level. So when they plant their avocado tree, they're like this. So there's no way if you water this that the water will stay above the soil level. It'll always sink back down to the soil level. And we had ours essentially the same thing. I just had a bigger amount. Actually, I, what I did with that is I planted three avocado trees on that. So. Well, if you can set up things, um, you know, drain systems and all that, that it's, but what we're trying to do is make sure that the soil doesn't stay saturated. And it's hard to do that if you have clay soil, even if you put drains down there, the clay just holds on to that water too much. If you get it above ground, then the clay below it is like blotter paper. It sucks it dry, but yeah, it's hard to drain. You know, sandy soil is easy to drain, but if you have clay soil, it's really hard to get the excess water out of it unless you're above grade, so. Because there are French drains. You can put French drains in that are underground drain systems, but if you have clay soil, the water just doesn't go in there. It just stays in the soil itself. And, I mean, some people will do this, put a dry well underneath it, fill it with rocks, that could work, although just for that one spot, it doesn't really help it further out here. Now, the plants we grow, are, since they come in essentially perfect soil, our top pot, potting soil, has no compost in it. So putting this in the ground, you don't have to really do much else. You just dig a hole, drop it in, just use either the native soil or your or a sandy soil around it. I mean, if you want to surround us with nothing but sand, it'll grow faster. The more airy the soil is, uh, that, that's why hydroponics, they make it so airy in the soil mix. The more oxygen you can get into the root zone, the faster plants grow, the more often you've got to water them. So there's, uh, there's trade-offs. In clay soil, plants grow slower. In sandy soil, they grow faster. So if you want to really make this thing grow fast, I mean, you can put pure pumice around your volcanic rock, then you got to water a couple times a day, but it will grow faster if you do that. And really there's no disadvantage on water use. If you have pumice as a soil, you don't have to water as much, but you got to water more frequently. So you can you get by with the same amount of watering. If you have clay here, clay holds so much water, you don't have to water very often, it'll hold it. But, you know, it's about the same amount, so. Now, avocado trees, this, you know, how much water these. Well, anyway, let's, let's finish this. So, put them in the mound. When you first get them planted, now, if, if it was summer, this is, you know, we're coming on the winter, we got winter weather already. In summer, we definitely put a berm around it and capture the water and get that thing really soaked good the first day. Uh, anytime you do any planting, you've got to really soak that ground good. I mean, I, I remember when I first started planting plants, I would put a berm around them and water them once, and then come back and get my shovel out and dig a little bit. The water only went down that far. I mean, if you've got normal dirt, it holds quite a bit of water, so you've got to water that thing over and over and over. I mean, we were next to a farm for four years, and whenever they planted a crop, they had their overhead sprinklers going on for like half a day. They just want to make sure they got the water soaked in deep. And apparently it takes a bit of effort to get dry soil soaked good. Now with this rain, we had about two inches, I believe. Uh, that'll soak the ground. Two inches, if you have normal soil, probably go down about uh, six inches or so. If it's clay soil, it might only be going down about four inches. But uh, so that might have gotten our soil pretty good and wet through and through now. So plant them, water them good. Uh, when they're young, uh, lots of fertilizer. Now, 
in Brokaw's website, they have, they said when they put it, when they planted an avocado tree, they surround it with 35 pounds of gypsum on the surface. That's a lot of gypsum. <laughs> this is a 30 pound bag, so essentially they're putting this much around each tree. Um, now, gypsum is calcium sulfate, and calcium is the fourth most important, actually it's probably the third most important nutrient that plants need after nitrogen and potassium. It's calcium, then phosphorus. They said the problem is, is that uh, most authorities have left out calcium for some reason. Calcium is more important for, especially for trees, than phosphorus in, a, in the quantity needed. So don't forget to put gypsum down a little bit every year, they said in avocados. It does several things. Gypsum does temporarily help the ground absorb water faster. Uh, but calcium is a part of the wood of trees, so it's important there. Um, and it also helps uh, complete the fruit properly. So they. Well, you can't hurt it by doing too much because there are places in, in America that are straight gypsum and plants grow in it. So apparently it's not toxic, but. Uh, um, they're saying on young trees they put 30 to 35 pounds around each tree in their four foot mound. So uh, I don't know. I would, when I did mine, I did five pounds. I put five pounds out. I was saying 30 pounds is way, that's a huge amount of gypsum. Yes. When you do the mound, can you actually use retaining bricks around sure. and raise the ground up? Yeah, I, at my own house, I actually had. Uh, Keystone blocks, holding it back a little bit. Now, if you use sandy soil on these mounds, because uh, before I planted my avocados, I left that mound bare for like three years. The rains didn't move it at all. I was surprised. Well, I'm not surprised anymore. I mean, you know, on a beach, you got sand. The waves have a hard time moving that, so you know that rain won't move. If this is mostly sand in here, the rain just doesn't move it. If it's clay, clay is a smaller particle the water moves at. It'll, it'll flatten it out pretty fast. Pardon? I don't think so. I think you, you put them down any time. Yeah. Well, gypsum, um, the one thing it's, that it does chemically is it allows sodium to leave the soil. So if you've got a sodium buildup, a salt buildup in your, from the tap water, you put gypsum down, the calcium takes the place of the sodium, and the sodium's allowed to leach away. So it, it helps eliminate salts that are harmful, sodium being the main one that's harmful to avocados. So, so. that's another reason I use it. But they said for it also, uh, phytophthora root rot, which is the main problem with avocado trees, doesn't like, cal doesn't like the, the gypsum around either helps prevent the root rot. Okay, so then if this was summer, we'd be watering pretty much every day, a uh, gallon a day for trees that are, well, this, this is pretty small still, maybe a half gallon a day on something like that. But by the time they're this size, it'll be three or four gallons of water per day. And on full-size avocado trees, it's more like... Uh, 50 gallons of water per day if you've got a 15-foot tree. So avocados are a fairly water-intensive orchard. Now, um, they've been, just like the rest of agriculture, what they're doing with avocado trees is trained to be smaller. They found out that the most efficient size of, an, of a fruit tree in an orchard is only six foot wide, or five foot wide, in fact. Now avocados, it's pretty hard to keep them that small, but they're keeping them smaller and useful. So in the old days, they had them grow like 20 foot across. And they found out that the light doesn't penetrate more than about three feet through the leaves. So you've got the shell of production in an inside area that's totally non-productive. But if the tree is only five foot across, the entire volume of that tree is productive. So the goal now is to have more avocado trees on the farm keep them smaller by pruning them. So it does take quite a bit of pruning to do that, but you'll get, you'll get paid for that, so. When's the best time to prune? Winter. 
well, severe pruning winter, but you can prune all year. Um, they, you know, they, what they're finding out is that most of the fruit on avocado tree form at the bottom. When you keep the tree small, you get real heavy production on the bottom branches um, because they're more horizontal on top of that. But we've seen that a lot. Uh, the bottom branches of avocado trees that are, say, 10 by 10 have most of the fruit on them. So you don't have to let them get that big. Um, I never use, you know, now I, I brought this in, this 24 inch box. Now, if you asked me 20 years ago if I would plant an avocado tree in a pot, I'd say it doesn't produce heavy enough to be worth it in a pot. But a friend of mine had an avocado in one of these and he had 80 fruit on his tree. I'm going, okay, that blows that theory. <laughs> so they can really produce well in a small container. I was surprised, 80, 80 avocados in a, an avocado that was maybe this wide and it might have been four, four and a half foot tall. So maybe four and a half to five foot across by four, four foot tall. 80 fruit forming on that tree. I, I don't think they all could have made it, but it was certainly an impressive looking crop though. Well, do you want something that's narrow at the top and wider at the bottom? That, you know, the, the ideal shape is supposed to be a dome, but it's real hard to do a dome on a, on a fruit tree, so they, they talk about a um, spindle shape, kind of like Christmas tree. So higher in the, at the tip and then wider at the base. Right. Right. So I saw a video on how they grow avocados in greenhouses in Japan, and there it's totally different because it's a low greenhouse. You know, they can't grow them outside. It's too cold in the winter. So they grow them in big tubs, and they let them go about a foot tall, and then they have the branches going in two directions about that angle. And that's it. They have each, they have all these containers lined up in this greenhouse with the, uh, branches is going like that because they don't they can't afford to get very tall in that greenhouse so they do that and they get really good production on these almost flat they can't grow them flat because if you grow a branch flat it doesn't grow any longer you have to keep it a little tilted to get to get the length on it yeah it looked like they had some stakes on them um, some cross stakes Maybe like that. I, I couldn't see it too well in the video, how they're supporting that. I have a Mexico wood that's um, a spalier. It has a concrete wall just because it's such a small yard so it's really hard to put it. And it's growing really, really well. Uh, is there any special thing that you do for pruning it? No, not really. They don't talk about too much in avocados how to train the branch structure because yeah. it's really just real bushy. Uh, but I would say the main thing is the more horizontal the branches are, usually the more productive they are. Not, you know, if they're going straight up, it's hard to get them to produce. Right. Does the fruit come off new wood or old wood? Well, it's, it's coming off the tips, but there's a lot of bran side branching in avocados along the major branches. There's a lot of little side branches that, that form. So it's, it's not that critical. It's not like a peach tree and all the Yeah. Well, on avocados, you can say, as long as you're not cutting off every leaf on that branch, it can still produce the next year. And if you cut off every leaf on that branch, then it'll take a whole year to recover and get fruit again. Yes. The roots won't grow there. Yeah, the roots. Will it eventually get the root system to where it, to where it'll it may, but it may just slowly die too. <laughs> so it's yeah, it's nice to uh, not to have good soil. I mean, you can always go back in there and dig it out. Yeah. Fifteen gallon. Well, it's called a fifteen. It's not really fifteen. About six months ago, should have been out of there. 
It's getting, it's getting pretty big for that pot. So. Okay, so water it, fertilize. Uh, we want a mulch on here too. So eventually it's nice to cover this mound up. All the soil should be covered. Uh, especially in young trees because the temperature of the soil gets really hot in the summertime if it's bare. So they found out in orchards if the soil is bare and it's 90 degrees, this, the area where the roots are, which is about a foot deep, is 120. It's too hot. If you cover with three inches of mulch, it limits it to 86 degrees and roots are happy with that. So mulching the ground around young trees is real important. As the tree gets bigger, it shades the ground around. It's not as important. Now avocados the orchards used to clean off the dead leaves. They thought the rotting dead leaves on the ground were contributing to root rot. And then they found out by research it's exactly opposite. The, some of the chemicals that come out of the rotting leaves are actually discouraging root rot. So now they just leave the leaves piled up. A friend of mine actually went down to Guatemala 15 years ago to see how the wild avocado trees were growing. And he says they dug to, through five foot of dead leaves underneath those trees before they hit the ground. So they really pile up underneath avocados. But they like that. So leave that stuff there. Um, and, you know, there's nobody in the forest unburying the trunk. So don't worry so much about that. Now, we do have to make sure they get adequate water. So adequate water, for most plants you want their entire root system to stay moist year round, especially avocados since they're green all year. Now avocado roots tend to grow about a foot into the ground. They don't go that far down unless you have real sandy soil because they can't breathe. Avocado roots need more oxygen than most fruit trees. So pretty much around here, uh, keep the top foot of soil wet around the tree. Now the only way to check that, you can't, you know, there's no, you know, they have those little meters, but they're Things are only about this long. Um, farmers would walk around with rebar. This is not rebar, but it looks like one, but about the same usage. See if you can push in the ground. If you push real hard by hand, about a foot deep, foot and a half if you want to be even better to your tree. Because generally, if the ground is moist enough for plants to get water out of the soil, it'll give and you can stick, a, stick through it, any kind of stick really. Uh, if it's dry, it doesn't budge. You can't push it through. So you know how modeling clay is. If it's moist, you can push anything through modeling clay. If it's dry, you can't push anything through it. That's how soil works. Moist enough for a plant. You know, you might have to use a little strength, but you should be able to push your rod or stick in the ground about a foot, foot and a half, and you're happy. So, and the tree will then be happy too. We have uh, one bug that'll go after your tree if it's not wet enough. So there's a new bug that came into the California, I think it's been three years now. It's called a polyphagus beetle. It's only about that big, but um, it's got, it's a weevil type beetle, so it's got the snout on the front end and it's got the legs. Um, but what it does is it it drills into the bark of a tree, and it goes after a lot of trees. I mean, they're really messing up sycamores in Orange County, um, but quite a few trees. What their goal is, is they drill into the tree, and um, their larvae eat the wood, but their larvae can eat wood. Not, not many creatures can eat, actually digest silos, which is wood, so they're bringing a fungus with them. So when they pierce, drill into the trunk, they put this fungus is in their bodies. It, it enters the wound, and they lay their eggs in that same area. The fungus eats the wood up, and the baby um, larvae, the little grubs in there, eat the fungus. So it's a symbiotic relationship. And we've seen avocado trees with some of the older ones. And you can tell they were mistreated because the yard is bone dry, all the grass is brown. <laughs> so you see these branches, big branches this have this water-soaked area. The, all the bark is all black and slimy looking. And then you see a little area where they drilled into it, where the sap has come out. 
and turns into white crystals. So you see these little volcanoes of white crystals surrounded by this wet, wet, they call it wet bark, water-soaked bark, and that's the beetle feeding in there. And pretty much the only thing you can do to cure that tree is to cut it off below the wounded area. Um, when this beetle first came in, the avocado growers were up in arms. They're going, oh my god, this is going to be the doom of avocado orchards. And then they, what happened, none of them got attacked because they water enough. So if you water your trees enough, this beetle can't attack them. So what you'll see, sometimes what you'll see is a little hole drilled in with the white crystallized sap around the hole and the beetle couldn't get in because the sap was coming out and keeping it out of the tree. So that's the, that's the tree's defense is the sap coming out of that hole that the beetle's trying to drill through. Um, but yeah, if we have a drought, they can, like we had, then they can all be in trouble if you back off on the water too much. Now, just so you know, avocado trees, when they get, you know, the, the old days when they, they would let them grow 20, 25 foot tall, and then they couldn't reach the fruit anymore, so they would just stump them. They come down to four foot stumps in the winter time, and they would sit there for a while, for a few months, and then they would develop new growth buds and then shoot up. And by the next year, they'd be another six foot up and be ready to produce at a smaller height. Uh, so if you have a beetle attack anywhere and it's not near the base of your tree, you can just cut that area off and let the tree regrow. So during the drought we had, 2013 in San Diego, they told the growers, you're not getting any water this year. So a lot of the growers did that. They just stumped their trees at four foot. They didn't have to water them for like three months, which, you know, which pretty much saved the trees. And then the trees started growing, and they were smaller, so they didn't have to use as much water as they did before. Uh, in 2014, I did my own tree. I said, OK, let's try this. I want to see if this actually works. So I stumped it at four feet with a chainsaw, made a prettier tree, because my tree was kind of all over the place. We just cut it, and it came up almost Christmas tree shape, and it flowered the next year and had fruit again. So uh, it regrew fast enough, and then it would, it, we, so we lost essentially one year of crop. Did you take the opportunity when the suckers came out at the bottom to graft the multiple varieties on the one? No, I had four other avocados in my yard. <laughs> we were good. So, but that, that is a method that people use. So I, we were, we had a talk once with the guy who grafted avocado orchards to different varieties. So they would stump the trees real low. And when the suckers grew, they would graft those instead of grafting the trunk. It's just easier to do a, a sprout from the dirt than it is uh, the trunk of the tree. And they do grafting when the, in, when the weather's warm, like May, June. Uh, it's got to be around 80 degrees. Now, our growers do them in greenhouses, so it's artificially warm. Don't need to. You don't have to treat wounds on trees if you, know, if you cut off with the chainsaw. The uh, forest department determined about 30, 40 years ago that wood automatically seals itself the moment it's damaged. The thing you have to be careful of is if you cut it once, don't cut it again in that same area at all. As they said, tree wounds can plug themselves one time. But if, you're, if you damage them, re-damage the plugged area, it can't re-plug itself again. It has to retreat about a foot and try again. So just be careful. If you prune it once, don't come back and prune that same, same area again. Yeah, the weight can do it. <laughs> well, they have a lot of ways you can support trees, you know, put sticks underneath them. Um, one time I put a real big stake in the center of my tree and tied branches to that, like, look like a Christmas tree effect almost. 
but uh, oh, let's talk a little bit about the types of trees we get. So most of the trees that we get from Brokaw are grafted to a seedling. So if you look at the bottom of this tree, there's a, a pit still in the ground there. So they bury the pit, original pit, and they use uh, Zutano avocado pits because they can't sell the fruit, so they just use the pit to grow the roots. It's a big pit, so it makes a real a nice, sturdy, young tree. So they grow that for several months, and when it's about, say, that tall, they cut off the top of it and graft on a branch of the tree we want. In this case, this is a holiday. So this tree was grafted uh, about a year and a half ago. So they grew the Zutano pit last year in the spring, uh, grafted it late summer, early fall, sent us the trees late winter, early spring. Um, this might have been done a little later, in fact. We got this one in summer, and then have, then we, they, the grower grows them in little pots about the size of a paper towel, we call that the paper tube. That's about the size of the container they grow them in, just big enough to get the seed in there. We take those and put them in a bigger pot, put them our top pot, potting soil around it. Uh, we got these, they were, they're actually pretty tall when we got them in the summer, and then they've grown a little bit more beyond that point. And then about ready to be planted. I mean, you can leave them here for a few more months if you wanted to. We'll get, we'll get to that a little later. Okay. okay, so that's the conventional way. Most retail avocado trees are grown this way. Most commercial avocado trees are grown a different way. So this is one that we call it on a clonal rootstock. So when you have seeds, now they use nothing but Zutano seeds. So seeds are like your kids. They're <clears throat> similar to you, <clears throat> but they're not identical. And every so often you can have a real bum, bum child. So, you know, when you, when you grow, and, and once in a while you can have an incredibly good child too. So one out of ten seeds, you know, one out of ten plants grafted onto seedlings may fail for that customer, which is not good. So in orchards they want a little better chance, so they clone the seeds. They, they you know, they have the genetically identical rootstocks on these trees. And the way they do that is, is a little more complicated. So you don't see a seed at the base of this one because it's, it's buried a little bit deeper. So Brokaw and University of California Riverside came up with the method. It's kind of, it's just interesting, the method they use to create the clonal rootstocks. Because it's hard to root, it's hard to root cuttings of avocado trees. It's not easy. It's, it's not impossible, but it's time consuming and it's slow. So what they still do is they have this tube, this plastic tube that they started them in. They still use the seed to start everything up. See, the seed grows like this. So it's a Zutano seed. And then they take the tree that they want the rootstock, the roots from. So, um, in this case, I think that was, I think that was Dusa. So there's a tree called a Dusa tree uh, that has incredibly strong roots. The fruit may not be good, but the roots are really good. So that they do is they, when this is t tall enough, they cut off the top of this seedling and put on a little stem from the Dusa tree and let the Dusa tree grow for a while. And then they put it, they darken the greenhouse, so it's pretty dark in there, which makes this thing want to root easier. When things are in the dark, they root easier. And then they fill the dirt. So the original dirt level, say, was here. Now they do another thing, too. They put a little metal ring around the stem, which will eventually cut it off. It's a real tight little ring. Eventually cut their circulation off and kill that part of the plant. 
they cover this up with dirt and that encourages to root out in this darkened room it roots out and then when that's got some size then they come back with the tree they want in this case this was I think surprise cut that off and put the surprise on top of it and let it grow so when we get these plants there'll be healthy roots up here there'll be dead seed and dead roots at the bottom now we did some experimenting too so we've taken them apart and pulled this part off to see if it made any difference to the plant if it would grow better or not without this thing on there this dead part didn't see any significant difference so we don't bother anymore just leave it there so Well, it helps a little bit. It's still better not to, but uh, it is. This was uh, chosen because of its root rot disease resistance. Um, now, they're starting to choose rootstocks for different reasons. Um, in the last five years, they said, well, we've got to find rootstocks that handle dry soil better. So, there are rootstocks coming in from Israel and some other parts of the world that they're trialing to see if they're more resistant to drought because that seems to be just as important as rot, root rot disease but root rot disease you get a lot either if the spot that part of your orchard is this low and the water collects there and then just sits there in the winter all you know for months after month I mean you know if the ground is underwater for just a day and it and it leaves it's not a big issue it just if it sits there for weeks at a time then the roots eventually use all the oxygen up in the water that's in the ground and then they start rotting but if it's only for a few days it's not a big deal um, but if it's too long then there's a problem but drought is just as important now so not that I know of So in this case, you know, 100% of these trees have the same root system, same genetics. So you're most likely, more likely to get a good tree. Whereas from the seedling rootstocks, you can get, you know, one out of ten trees may just be a bum tree. Doesn't do much. So uh, there's no tap root on any tree. That that was uh, I don't know that they don't talk about that anymore because. <laughs> You only get tap roots when you grow trees in tall containers, not in the ground. So, I mean, you get tap roots if your soil is really gravelly. You know, if, the, if there's plenty of air straight down, the roots will go as deep as they can breathe. Kind of interesting. So, in certain areas of California, like especially some of the inland areas, Hemet. Elsinore, that soil is so gravelly sandy, the roots can go straight down for long ways, but not, not normally. You don't see the taproot on trees. So, Okay, so that's how they create the clonal rootstocks. These trees usually run 10 to, to I don't know, it depends on the grower. Uh, some growers don't charge a whole lot to do this. Some growers charge double because they had to graft it twice. So... Well, it's not that much. So, when we sell, a, when we get our trees in from Brokaw this spring, if it was on regular root, uh, seedling rootstock, it'd be around fifty dollars. If it's on clono, it'd be around eighty. That's the difference. So it's uh, it's it's substantially more, but it's not prohibitively more. And if you're uh, if you're an orchard, your bank will make you buy the clonal rootstock. They don't want to take chances on your trees. So I just have a few on clonal right now. This wasn't done by Brokaw. This was done by another nursery. And we and they and this grower was growing this thing in almost pure coconut core instead of real dirt. Brokaw uses real dirt in their in their uh, soil uh, containers. So we had to take it out of there and put it in ours. It hasn't totally taken off yet. We did this just uh, at the end of July. It's sitting around recovering still.
Okay, fertilizer wise, when they're young, you just want to keep feeding them. Uh, just keep feeding them all year, you want them to grow. The goal is to make a big green ball at least six by six before you back off and let them fruit. Because the most important thing is to prevent sunburning and the leaves. Uh, the part of the tree that sunburns the easiest are the branches. So on this particular tree, I, f I saw a whole bunch of burned branches on it. Well, here, this branch here, was, un was exposed to the sun, and on one side of it, it turned black. I don't know if you see that. The other side is green, but one side facing the sun. What happened on this tree, I believe, is it fell down on a hot day. And so the foliage usually shades this branch, but when it fell on its side, it looks like this whole side of this tree just burnt in the sunlight. So you can tell when your tree's planted in the ground which side the sun can hit the most. It's usually whatever facing south. Uh, or you know, a branch going just like this, perpendicular to the sunlight, that would burn the easiest. If the branch is heading straight toward the sun, it generally won't burn because the leaves are shading it all the way. You could. It doesn't hurt the tree to whitewash it now. Uh, generally, we have been using um, a white or light-colored latex paint. You can cut it in half with water, make it half water, half paint, and just paint any of the branches. You don't have to paint the leaves, just the branching. The leaves just don't burn. Now, if a leaf burned, you would know it because the edges of the leaf are cooler, and the center stem is stronger, so they would burn in a pattern off, not on the edge, kind of away from the edge. So when a leaf burns from the heat, it usually burns about like this, between veins, something like that. That's a heat burn. This is a dryness burn or salt burn. When a tree is sucking on the last bit of water in a pot, all the salt is there. So it pulls up the salt, the salt burns the edges. And the leaves just stay like that. Now, in orchards, this time here you go to an orchard, you'll see nothing but burnt edges. They, you know, water is so expensive, that's their main cost. They just don't want to water that much, and they'll put up with 10% of the leaf being burnt. And you can just leave the leaves on. There's no reason to take them off, right? Yeah, they're still productive. They're, st they're not hurting the tree. So... So we can paint them with the with latex. Now the orchards use something else because paint is apparently not organic. So they make a concoction up and we get it now. Ivy Organic sells this. It's um, silica, which is essentially sand or glass, what do you want to call silica. And um, it's got limestone mica silica and dried milk so and then they mix with water and in the orchards they would apply it by airplane sometimes just spray it on on the orchard to whitewash it but this would be more of a professional type it's kind of expensive because it's low volume thirty dollars there's enough in here to paint about five trees so not bad um, and you don't have to mix it all up at once. This is a dry powder in here. It only goes about this high in there. And then there's a little vial of essential oils, which helps keep bugs and things from crawling on the trunks for a while. The essential oils only work for about a month. The uh, whitewash will last on the tree for over a year. So. So you can, you can just, if you do it all at once, you fill the whole can with water. If you want to just do bit by bit, you can just use part of it. Now some of the other things we do on avocados, um, most orchards will run this in their watering system once in a while. This is uh, mono and dye potassium salts of phosphorus acid. 
So this, this product we sell is called Garden Foss. There's a lot of other names used around the country. It's actually a fertilizer. Phosphorus and potassium are both fertilizers, but they found out that this will, can actually stop root, root rot disease in its tracks. So they said they've been able to cure almost dead avocado trees from root rot by injecting this into their trunk. Now we don't sell injection stuff, uh, although they do at Orange County Farm Supply, but uh, they said they just run this and, and use it as a, a fee, um, fertilizer in the water now and then. I think a lot of orchards do it once a month or so, just as preventative. But they don't know exactly how it works, but phosphorus, the, the mineral phosphorus is involved a lot in um, curing diseases, fighting off diseases. So we actually got sent letters all from UC Riverside, all the nurseries back around 1998 about this product. They said it's incredible what it can do. Now it's become valuable because it stops a lot of the new diseases coming into the U.S. Uh, sudden oak death. Um, downy on roses, downy on impatiens, downy on basil. Uh, there's a lot of diseases that have arrived in the U.S. in the last 20 years that this is helping to stop. So that's just yeah, it goes through the roots. Yeah. It would probably help them. Yeah. Now the other thing that avocados can get, um, that's, there's not many common pests. Occasionally grasshoppers will get to them or, and sometimes you'll get caterpillar damage. When they do, when they eat on the leaves you get, you know, edges cut like this. Sometimes if you get little beetles that feed on the leaves, they just do this all over the leaves, which is not that dangerous. But the main pest that we get uh, is Persea mites, which is a little spider mite that causes uh, silvery to brown patches all along the veins. This came into California from Mexico um, early 1990s. And it came in by itself, this one spider mite. Each, when, you, when it's fresh, it's a silvery patch on the leaf. Each silvery patch, if you look at it through a jeweler's loop, is a spider web. And each underneath, each spider web on that leaf is a little colony of mites living underneath there. And they're sucking on this tree, trying to get all the chlorophyll out of it, or sucking the life out of the leaf. They had just turned brown, the trees were just totally defoliating, but that cured them. You know, when they dropped all their leaves, the mites were gone, they grew back after a while, but of course they lost the crop that year, and they sunburn real easy. So we would get the oil out, uh, either a horticultural oil of some sort, like neem oil or this one, and just spritz them down once, and that would stop it. One spray would do, would clean them up really well. It's not as important now because they brought in a predator mite to eat this mite. And you can tell the which is the predator mites because these guys really don't move underneath their little webs. The predator mites actually move, and you can actually see them moving. They're moving like little lions. They're moving around the leaf at a fairly high rate of speed for a mite. So they said what happens now is the mites will go through the orchard, the per se mites will go through the orchard and then a wave of predator mites are right behind them. So they don't usually have to spray the orchards anymore. They'll just wait for the mites to catch up and, and wipe them out. Uh, on your home tree, you can, you, know, you can spray them with the oil. It's not that expensive, but it is expensive to spray this over an entire orchard. So now they let the, the good mites defeat the bad mites, but if you just want to get rid of them, one shot of oil will do it. So PT doesn't touch those? Pardon? PT? No. A BT is not very effective against anything, really. <laughs> uh, is, is there a certain time of year that you would want to do that? The mites usually appear during the warmer months, but any time, you know, that's any time between May and November, really. Okay. Yeah. So that's the worst pest we get. Um, 
Can't think of anything else. Thank you. All right. So, major topic, sore topic that we talk about is the A and B type avocado. So, the University of California may have done us a disservice a long time ago saying that you had to get an A and a B avocado. So there's A and B type avocado trees. The, on the A types, the, fe the flowers, which have both female and male parts, are female ready in the morning. We'll just do it this way. Female in the AM and the male parts of that flower mature in the afternoon of the same day so they're male in the afternoon and on the B type avocados the flowers are female in the afternoon and then the same flower the next day in the morning becomes the male so it's the same flower because but the flower can't pollinate itself. They're at different stages. So in theory, if you have an A avocado tree next to a B avocado tree, you'll get better fruit set. So they did the study with Hass avocados because 90% of the avocados grown are Hass type. Uh, and they found out the best pollinator was Zutano which is why we have so many seedlings grown from Zutano because you cannot sell Zutano to a store. They won't buy it. The fruit has always got the cracked skin at the bottom. It's, you know, it's decent flavor. It's not one of the top 20 avocados, but it has this defect where the skin's always got this rough spot at the bottom or cracking at the bottom. So no, no supermarket will buy it. So the literature that University of California sent out, Riverside sent out, is that if you have a block of avocado, has avocado trees, out of every nine trees, if you replace the one in the middle with the Zutano, you'll increase the production by all the surrounding trees by 11%. Well, if you do the math, take out one out of nine trees and replace it, <laughs> it's a wash. So the orchard people tell us, don't do it, it's silly. Um, now, it, you know, it's possible that other types of avocados are better if you cross-pollinate them, and it certainly doesn't hurt. But uh, Zutano just doesn't make any sense. So they brought out, so that's why they, we have Surprise. So Surprise may not be the best pollinator for Hass, but it is a B-type. And you can sell this to supermarkets. So uh, that's its purpose. So Surprise has become a popular tree because it's the best bee for commercial production. If you want to put a bee avocado in your orchard, Surprise looks like a Hass. They sell at the stores as a Hass avocado. I mean, there's a lot of different avocados being sold at the supermarkets that are not Hass, but they're all related closely to Hass, and this is one of them, surprise. Great, I think it's a great granddaughter of Hass. A little more Mexican, ripens a little bit earlier than Hass, uh, but tastes close enough and looks close enough that they can sell it as a Hass avocado. And it potentially can pollinate it also. It may not be a very good pollinator, but at least its potential is there. So the orchards are putting this in along with their other Hass trees. I mean, we have some nurseries around here promoting Fuerte as the best pollinator for Hass. I don't know where they got that information from. Fuerte is, uh, some of the avocado trees just bloom too early. Fuerte blooms winter into spring. Hass is more or less spring. So. Okay, so what they found out is that avocado trees generally are not this rigid on when, they, when the trees, when the flowers mature. 
He said, most avocado trees around midday will find both male and female flowers on the tree. And some, they said some branches are totally, totally off on the timing. So some branches are female in the, in the afternoon and male in the morning on the same tree. So it's like they said, yeah, it's not, you know, so generally, you know, we're the only, California may be the only place in the world where they promote having the two ty A and B types. No other country does that because it apparently doesn't matter. Um, the most, in fact, University of California did say the most important um, thing that has to happen when they bloom to get fruit is temperature. So number one is if it's 80 degrees when they're blooming, they said you'll get fruit. Number two, which I think should be number one, is bees. If the bees are on your tree, you need that. And number three is A and B type. So University of California Riverside said the temperature is, well, that makes a lot of sense. If it's, if it's cold, they're not going to make any fruit no matter what. And the bees aren't out when it's cold. But the bees seem to be the, the thing that make the most difference. Um, they said the worst thing that an avocado orchard can be situated, where it's situated, is next to a citrus orchard. They said the bees do not find avocado flowers very tasty. They're actually, they said the nectar is kind of bitter. I don't know if anyone tested that, but uh, they said the, the bees would rather go to a citrus than an avocado. So you don't want any citrus trees in your avocados because the bees just go over there. Um, so my yard, uh, it's about three years ago, it was June, and I had like five avocado trees in my yard, and I was going out there looking for fruit, see how much fruit I had set. There's like one. But I've got like 10 citrus in my garden mixed with the avocado trees and a whole bunch of other fruit trees too. So we said, this is not working. So we looked on YouTube and, and came across two different videos from two different people doing the same thing. They said, you've got to make the flowers more attractive to the bees. And the way you do that is you spray them with honey. So their formula was uh, one quarter honey three quarters water. So University of California knows that the problem is bees don't like the avocado trees because uh, they said on a typical has, full grown has tree, there's a million flowers, you get a hundred fruit, which is one flower out of every 10,000 flowers made of fruit. So one of the researchers that said, I bet you I can do better than the bees do. So we got a little paintbrush out and started pollinating all the flowers. He got 700 fruit on the tree. So he says, yeah, the bees just aren't doing a good job. <laughs> These other guys said, make the bees do the work, make it more attractive. So they would spritz the tr flowers, clusters with the honey and the water once a week while they're in bloom. And when they got done, it was like a cluster of grapes. So I had 10 flowers left on one of my avocado trees in June. I'm going, okay, let's give this a, sh a shot. So I got, got the honey and the water on there because I hadn't seen bees on my avocado trees at all that year. And the next day I go out there, there's five bees up there. I'm going, oh, that's pretty amazing. There's actually bees on my avocado tree. Out of the last 10 flowers, we got five fruit. Normally it's one out of 10,000. We got two out of, you know, we got one out of two on those last 10 flowers. So we're amazed. I mean, there's no way a tree can hold that much fruit, but it's better to have it and let it drop than not to have anything form at all. So that seems to be the trick to get the bees over to your place. Now, if you have a hive in your yard, you probably don't need to. Because a friend of mine has an orchard in Tust and she's got hives in her yard and she's got citrus, but she's got avocado trees there too. And the avocados seem to set pretty well with the hive right next to them. Well, naturally they naturally thin. So avocados, they said, uh, uh, they'll generally drop over 50% of their fruit during the summer. So I wouldn't do any thinning till late summer. I mean, the fruit will be about that big in September. If it's, if it's still there in September, it's going to make it. But uh, they tend to drop over half of their fruit during the summertime. So. Foliar fertilizer, you put a sugar in it, 
sugar. Yeah, I don't know if leaves can absorb honey. That form of sugar is, what is it, fructose? I'm not sure what the sugar is in honey, if plants can absorb that or not, but I certainly wouldn't hurt them. I don't know, fuerte is the word, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the varieties. Yeah. Um, could you talk about the licorice smell? That, and, and is it true that it's only on Mexican um, avocados? I don't know enough about that. So they're in the family of, you know, Loris noblis, the bay leaf, is the same family as avocados as are camphor trees. They all have a nice smell to the foliage. They said you can tell if it's Mexican because it has more of a more licorice smell to the leaf. Uh, if it's and it's also got the new new foliage comes out more red, and the Guatemalan ones that come out more green. But I don't know if that tro holds true for every avocado out there. <clears throat> if you know if they have more smell just than all the Mexican ones or not. But they definitely have odor to their leaves if you crush them. All the avocados have some kind of odor. Since they're in that that family, the laurel family, so. Okay, we'll go over the varieties. So, <clears throat> of course, Hass is by far the most popular. Hass. Well, the story is kind of interesting, but uh, most people have heard that. But uh, Forte was the original commercial avocado in California. Fuerte means strong, I guess, in Spanish. And it's because it's one of the, they were growing avocados apparently in Altadena, Pasadena area. They had a real bad freeze in the 1920s or whatnot. And the Fuerte is what survived the cold, so they called it that and started growing that one. And that's still rated as one of the top tasting avocados, top one or two avocados you can ever eat. The problem with Fuerte is it's a lousy producer compared to the Hass. Uh, so Fuerte trees, in fact, I have a textbook that says don't plant Fuerte orchards. Um, only 20% of the orchard trees produce fruit. And the other 80% sit there and do nothing. And they don't know why that is. They can't, they've never figured out why if you're grafting off the same, you know, branches off the same tree, why 80% of them do nothing and 20% of them do all the work. So I've had some customers tell me they've got a Fuerte tree in the yard, makes hordes of fruit. But a lot of people tell me, and my dad had the same problem, plant a Fuerte tree, never get anything. <laughs> it doesn't do anything. So we're not sure why that happens. Um, now they've done things to Fuertes to try to get them to produce. Uh, around November they said if you girdle the stems, uh, it'll help them. So girdling the stem, you take a big branch on this tree and you peel the bark off. Not, don't go too deep. You don't want to cut off the water circulation, but the bark of the tree is where the energy from the branches is sent down to the roots or sent south. So if you girdle the branch, it locks all the energy up here and makes this thing flower better. So that was one of the things they did to Fuerte orchards is peel off a half inch of bark all around it now, if, you, if, you, if it doesn't heal back in time, the roots at the bottom of the tree start to, to starve because they're missing their nutrition. So if it's half inch across this girdle, it'll heal within a year and then the roots can get their nourishment back. So they would girdle a lot of the branches in November. They said it not only made them bloom better, but it delayed the bloom by about a month or two, which got them into warmer weather on top of that, which helped the pollination because bees don't like it cold. So instead of blooming in say December, January, February, March, it would bloom more like March, April, May, something like that. So that was one thing they were doing to Fuerte to see if they can get it to produce better. But uh, Yeah, so that, that, yeah, girdling or any time you interrupt the flow of nutrition down the stem, that can help the end of the stem. Spring with sugar in the fall does the same thing. That's less uh, aggressive. 
spray the leaves with a whole bunch of sugar, get a lot of energy stored up in that branch to induce it to bloom. Um, so the timing of the bloom is important. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, I lost my train of thought. Anyway, so forte, we don't push very much. Now, I do have some fortes around. I think I have a one forte out there because it is very good flavored. And if you can make it produce or if you get lucky and you get a good tree, then uh, you're, you know, you got a, you got a great avocado. Um, but Hass, so Forte, Mr. Hass, Rudolph Hass was a mailman in La Habra and he was growing avocado trees on the side and he was trying to graft a seedling to the Forte tree and it wouldn't take. He grafted over and over and they were going to dig it out, but they said it was so strong a tree they would just let it grow and see what it, what it came to and that was the Hass. So Hass was a chance seedling. Uh, they said the the seeds were just gotten from restaurants and things around the area, so they don't know what the parentage was on that. But Hass grew in his yard. Uh, Brokaw was his neighbor. Brokaw started growing the trees for him. It was the first tree ever patented in 1928 or something. And by 1950, it was the number one variety being sold. Um, even though they patented, there weren't, there, there weren't and there still aren't patent police. So they said broke, uh, Hass only made $4,000 off the patent, even though it was a dollar per tree. <laughs> and he got returns on 4,000 trees because all the farmers would just take the one tree and graft everything from that tree. And he wasn't about to go over there and with a shotgun and tell them to pay him. So uh, he didn't make that much money off it. Anyway, so Hass um, had his tree. It became the number one seller across the world. Um, and again, Hass produces about 100 fruit per tree per year. Now, avocado, oh, I know what I was going to say. Avocados grow, if the avocado tree doesn't have any fruit on it, they grow about three feet a year. If they're producing heavily, any branch with fruit on it doesn't grow an inch. So the trees that produce the less, least amount of fruit usually grow the biggest, and that's Fuerte. So Fuerte trees can go, you know, 40, 50 foot if you let them. Um, now, at three foot a year, you can cut that off. You don't have to let it grow big at all. But potentially, they can do about three foot a year. Now, on certain rootstocks, I've seen some avocados grow f much faster than that. So, uh, but generally, three foot a year is typical. Now, Hass, according to the research, one out of three years, they get a good crop. It's typical for Hass. Uh, so two out of three years they grow, and one, one year they don't grow. So Hass can really produce a lot of fruit, but it doesn't do it reliably every year. And one of the reasons for that, it blooms uh, February to April. And some years, it's so cold, the bees just won't come out of their hives. Like 2008, uh, some friends of mine who had orchards said, nothing, <laughs> they didn't get anything. 2008. A lot of trees didn't wake up, a lot of deciduous trees. I remember our crepe myrtles that year did not leaf out until June. It was so weird. It was so cold that spring that nothing was waking up. And they said they blanked on their hass. So, but hass, you know, again, um, it is the number one variety in the world. And Brokaw, uh, once they started perfecting how to grow avocado trees, Brokaw has outlets in Spain, um, Australia, South Africa. So they, I don't know if they're, you know, if it's a part of them or just a partner to them in those countries, but they, their technique of growing avocado trees is spread around the world. So they, they become quite famous. They're, they moved from uh, La Habra to uh, Ventura. They're out in Ventura now. So there's Hass. But there's a lot of daughters of Hass. So lamb Hass is better producer than Hass. Not quite as good quality. It's still considered very good. But they said if you ever buy an avocado from the store and it's got little strings in it, probably lamb Hass. So if they're not perfectly ripe, they got those strings in there. But still, um, much better setter than Hass. 
I mean, we're amazed at what Lamb House does in our in the nursery. I don't have it in here, but I have some out. Out, we have our avocado trees on this side of the store where it's sunnier. Because um, in the nursery, small trees this big sometimes have 20, 30 fruit forming on them. Whereas a hass under the same conditions, same amount of flowers would have maybe two or three. The lamb hass really sets heavily, ripens a little bit later than hass. I think on your list it'll tell you the ripening dates. So that's one of the offspring of Hass. Um, University of California came out with Gwen and Whitzel back in the 60s, I believe. Gwen still sold, but not much in orchards anymore because Gwen has a very nasty tendency to defoliate in the wintertime. All the leaves drop off, but heavy producer. And these are both sold as dwarf trees but they, the researchers had a suspicion about them. So what they did is they, for five years in a row, they cut off all the flowers so they couldn't make fruit. Trees were all 20 foot tall. So as production was keeping these, they're, they're saying Gwen was an eight foot tree because in most orchards it would just hang in there eight foot, but it was always low with fruit. And it was the fruit that was keeping it from growing. But kind of weak otherwise. So they quit selling both of these, which though was very frost sensitive. Very frost sensitive. <clears throat> so uh, one of the daughters, so they planted a whole bunch of Gwen seeds and came up with Jim. The researcher named it after himself. His name was Gray Edward Martin. So it, <clears throat> it said 40 years of work. I put my name on it. So Jim is supposed to be the perfect version of Hass. Um, bigger fruit, better set, smaller tree. <clears throat> but they won't allow homeowners to have it, so it's hard for you to get a gem. Of course, uh, <clears throat> Brokaw sells gem, but they sell far more Carmen. University of California doesn't promote Carmen because it's not one of theirs. So Carmen uh, is named after Carlos Mendez down in Mexico. He has a, a ranch down there. And they found one hass tree in their orchard that was flowering more than once a year and setting fruit on each bloom. So they, in Mexico, it became a big hit because they would bloom in the fall. And in Mexico, if they bloom in the fall and get a good fruit set at that time, you get your fruit on the market before everyone else does in the spring. So uh, it became real popular down there. Brokaw, um, brought it up to California and started selling it in the 19, I think it was 1998, they patented it and started selling it. And they would sell, they said 250,000 of these every year to orchards throughout California. So we heard about it back around then and started selling them to our customers. And then about 10 years ago, they told us, oops, we're not supposed to sell it to homeowners. So they wouldn't sell it to us for, uh, until the patent wore off, which wore off uh, last year or two years ago wore off, the patent ended. So we can get them again officially. I mean, we got them under the table and through other means for a while there. But what Carmen does in California, it's different than Mexico. The false bloom doesn't happen here as, as much. But it blooms just like Hass in spring. If whatever branch doesn't have isn't loaded with fruit at that bloom, if the branch doesn't have fruit on it, it blooms again in August. And if there's any branch that doesn't bloom, doesn't have fruit on it at that time, then those branches bloom in October. And we've seen it bloom in our yard four times in one year. If it doesn't have fruit on it, it just blooms. The next time, they tend to grow with, have a new growth spurt every season. So with each growth spurt, if there's no fruit on there, there's flowers. And each time they bloom, they can make fruit. So the Carmen is the ever-blooming version of Hass, or ever-fruiting ever version of Hass. And, it's, and they said down in Mexico, they were getting 27 tons per acre per year. Hass normally does seven. So if, and that's in, in Mexico, which is a milder climate. So in California, if they can even do double what they're doing now, 
they're making a lot more money. So that's why most orchards are going for carmen over gem. Um, now, I don't have any single carmens at all here at the moment. We do have uh, 100 coming in the spring. Um, and we're also bringing in 200 liners that we'll grow ourselves. Um, so you can wait for a carmen if you want. But uh, that is, if you only want one avocado tree, that's probably the best one to get. Um, right, that's University of California notes. Well, it's just a hass. So everything about it is hass, except it blooms during, instead of just blooming in early spring to mid spring, it blooms summer, fall, winter. Uh, it, can, it just keeps on blooming. So it's just a hass tree. They said they've, you know, a lot of our customers said their hash tree blooms several times a year too, but they don't get any fruit on those other blooms. Uh, a few customers said they do get blooms on the other, uh, on, uh, fruit on the other blooms too, but this is the first time someone has been able to propagate a tree that does it over, does the reblooming. So, so it's a special tree. So it's not considered the best tasting avocado, but it certainly is the most worthy one. I mean, Hass is still considered in the top five, although I would say it's probably more like the top six or seven. But, uh, but if you have a Carmen tree in your house, you can pretty much pick a fruit any time of the year. So the orchards that grow Carmen say, yeah, they can go out and pick any time they want. Um, the interesting thing about Carmen is that the fruit come out different shaped at each bloom. So Fuerte, which blooms in the winter, is shaped like this. Hass, which blooms in spring, is shaped like that. A Pinkerton, which I have a few right now, I think I have one out there, which blooms December, January, February, fruit on it is shaped like this. Reed, which blooms late spring into summer shaped like this. So it, whenever the hass blooms, it's, its shape follows when it blooms. It's interesting. So when it blooms in the summer, the, those fruit come out around just like the reeds. So it's got different shaped fruit. And you can usually tell by the size of the fruit which one is ready to pick. And generally avocados, when they're about to fall off the stem, the little button of stem that holds the fruit on turns yellow. It's green normally, it turns yellow, then you know it's ready to fall off. In fact, most avocados have a five month period. So you can pick them five months before they fall off and they're still fully ripe. Or you can leave them on and let them fall off by themselves. They don't ripen on the tree. They stay hard until you pick them or until they fall off. I mean, it's like the raccoon in my yard would shake all the avocados off, come back a week later and eat them. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, they, they know what they're doing. So you got the Carmen. Um, Carmen's our number one selling avocado. Reed is our number two. So Reed is, is the only other one that they consider a commercially done avocado. So Hass and Reed are the two commercial avocados. Reed is better tasting than Hass by a bit. Um, we learned about Reed because one of the local uh, orchard guys came into our nursery and says, I grow has to sell, I grow Reed to eat. So we said, okay, we got to try this. He told us that Reed was like taking Hass and pouring bacon grease on it. So we started getting Reeds in at that time. Uh, so the regular Hass harvest date is uh, February through June, I believe. Although it depends where in California you are, because if you're in Monterey, it's more like uh, May through November. It ripens later there, but uh, around here it's more like February through June. You can pick it a little early, and you notice in the store, you know, some of the stuff is coming out, it's picked too early, and it doesn't, it just turns a rubber, it never softens up. That's when it's picked too early. We're probably getting the Carmen's out of Mexico right now, though. Uh, if it's from Mexico, it's a Carmen. 
But anyway, reed, um, the nice thing about it is it blooms um, April through June. So reed, they said, rarely has no crop because the blooms all the way into summer or close to summer. So reed has as good a crop every year as Hass does one out of three years. Reed will do every year. So they said reed pretty much produces 300% more than Hass because it never has an off year. <coughs> the fruit is larger. It's like little cannonballs. They do have a real thick skin, but it is green, so you can't tell, you know, it doesn't turn black like Hass does. And you harvest it, uh, generally, I believe it's uh, June through October. But I don't know, when I grew reed in my house two houses ago, we always ate them all before June. <laughs> they, were, they were good by April. We always cleaned off our tree before the, the normal harvest time. And I've seen in some books where they said June through November. But that's probably in the colder up north more where it hangs on longer. But locally in the farmer's markets, you'd always see them around August and September. At the latest, they would have their clean, trees cleaned off. So you don't have to wait that long. I mean, the fruit on reed is on there for over a year. So if it blooms this time, it, you pick, start picking a year later. A lot of the uh, Mex uh, Guatemalan varieties of avocados, Hass's part in Guatemalan, you, it's on the tree for a whole year. Reed is on for a whole year, but you can leave it on almost a year and a half. So, so then there's a holiday avocado, which is the main one I have at the moment. Holiday is the one that that the field station, so the field station Irvine off of uh, Irvine Boulevard is where they develop most of these avocados other than Hass. Most of these were developed right there. And their favorite, they said for homeowners, is holiday. They, they say it's got everything that you'd want. This is a holiday here. So it's a small tree. The fruit ripens throughout the major holidays now. I've seen both July through Thanksgiving July 4th to Thanksgiving and Labor Day through New Year's Day. I'm not sure which one it's supposed to be. But anyway, it's the second half of the year that holiday ripens, so it's on there a long time too. Really big fruit. I would say even bigger than reed, shaped about like that. A little bit more pear shaped than reed is. Um, Fairly thick skin, but real, to me it was, they gave, they gave me a sample, it was called XX3 back in the 80s. It was like a stick of butter to me. It was really good. So holiday is a good one. The tree is small uh, also, stays small. So holiday is hard to beat. Uh, since Carmen, if you get a Carmen, most of the fruit's going to ripen before summer. And a little bit in the later part of the year, on holiday, all of it ripens after summer or toward the end or uh, latter part of the year. So that'd be a good compliment if you want to do Carmen and holiday. Or Carmen and reed is also a good pair to do. Um, Gary, it says on this sheet that the holiday can be hard to grow. What do they mean? Well, up until the time we started growing them, it was just uh, Durling and Laverne that took retail suppliers growing them and none of their trees do well. So, oh, I shouldn't say that on the, but, but they don't grow, they grow them in compost so it makes it more difficult to, you know, you have to, if you buy one from them on their little ticket that says, don't water this too much, because <laughs> it rots. So they were the only ones licensed to grow that for a long time and I lost mine that I got from them. And most people lost their, their holidays that those growers grew. But now that we're growing them, there's no problems. They're just like any other avocado tree. So they're not difficult. How old does a tree have to be to start producing fruit? At what age? Um, so this is about a year old, maybe a little more than a year old. It'll be about two second. When it's about two years old, then it blooms the next spring. So. They'll be as big as this when they start blooming. 
I mean, people keep emailing, ask me to, if we have a 24 inch box avocado trees and we know that they're being sold for around $500 and that's like uh, a few months older than that and that's like two years since it was this big. It's like you, you know, paying five. They can buy a lot of fruit for five hundred dollars, so uh, don't buy the big trees. In fact, we—it's all horror stories. We we hear the tree died in two months, the tree died in five months. Uh, you can't keep them alive because it's just a big root ball full of compost. So it's real hard to keep those things going. I mean, the growers that put them in compost in these boxes, it's a little bit easier to grow them in this box because it's so airy. The roots can breathe through the sides of that box, but you put that whole thing of compost in the ground, it's, a, it's just like instant death. They can't breathe in there. I always bought big trees because the small ones would always die on me, but now I know that the compost is what, what's killing them. So the bigger ones with just the 15 gallons seem to, to <coughs> Well, the big trees have a little more strength in them, but yeah, if the grower didn't do a good job with the dirt. It's when I grew back in the 80s, the, some of the 15 gallon avocado trees that I planted actually made it, but from the same growers in the 90s, they would just sit and drop leaves, grow the leaves back, drop them, grow them back, drop. I couldn't get them to do it and get anywhere. They would just sit around like on a treadmill for five years. And after five years of that, I said, I give up. I can't make this tree do anything. But when I get them from Brokaw, you know, I mean, some of the Brokaw trees I've had, 10 feet of growth in one year. <laughs> it's just crazy. Uh, most of them I get three to five feet of growth. But, uh, so the rootstock does make a difference too. Um, let's see. So we talked about, oh, I forgot to put surprise in there. Surprise the nether pass offspring and then um, I'll mention now and then we get Edinger in. Edinger is a daughter of Fuerte, better producer than Fuerte, not quite as good. So now and then we carry Edinger because in the nursery a tree this big of Edinger will have 20-30 fruit on it too just like lamb has so it's a good producer. That was um, grown in, is that's from Israel. They sent four to Israel. Israel took daughters of it and created Edinger. Um, what about some of those big, huge, humongous uh, ones that you see around the place? That, um... Well, Reed and Holiday are both pretty big, but yeah, there are some really big avocados. Most of them are from the West Indy type. Okay. Now, in Florida, they grow the West ones from West Indy because they like that weather better, the real tropical, humid weather. Um, they call them the slim coddles because they're very low in oil, which really doesn't make them slim. I mean, the, apparently the more oil you eat, the slimmer you stay, but that's another subject. But, um, so they're not generally as good, but there are some big avocados around, like there's one called Anaheim. There's one, there's some really big fruited ones that generally aren't grown that much because what do you do with a five pound avocado? I mean... You got to share it with your neighbor. <laughs> so the big ones generally aren't grown as much. Like they say, reeds, two pound avocado, up to two pounds. A lot of that goes to restaurants. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there there's some big ones. I mean, there's some there there have been big ones in Orange County too. They just no one's growing them because it's you know again, what do you do with that five pound avocado? You just can't do much with it. Um, so the top rated ones, taste wise, well the top rated one is hard to get. So in their opinion, the top rated one is oop, is Jan Boyce. Now I've eaten the top five. And there's not a huge difference between the very best ones and the runner-ups. It's not huge, but I guess if you 
live among the trees and you get to eat them every day. Jen Boyce comes out the best overall. But that is from uh, Florida. Uh, our supplier says they've got no budwood from it. I've got a couple trees in my house, so my daughter is starting to do some grafting off of Jan Boy, so we'll see if we can get that one going for customers who really, really want it. So it's not available commercially, although I think there's a grower down in this area that might be doing it. I've got a couple of grafts on mine. Mm -hmm. And then the next one is rated as Sharwell, which they put on here as Kona Sharwell, but the proper name is Sharwell. It's from Australia via Kona, Hawaii. So it, from Australia, I went to Kona, came to California, so the Sharwell. I've eaten that one. It's, it's good too, but I can't say it's a whole lot better than Hass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they're certainly worth a lot more than bananas right now. So Charwell, uh, we sold out a couple weeks ago what we got in, and I won't, may not have any until, well, I'll try to get some next spring. We'll see if we can get any more Charwells. Um, so that's a highly rated one. They said the unique thing about Charwell is the fruit can hang on the tree ripe 11 months. So even though it's not a year-round producer, the crop it makes can hold long, you know, if you don't eat them all, you can leave them on the tree for a long time. So that's Sherwill. Um, and we'll get that as often as we can. Reed is also in one of the top five. So it's Jan Boy, Sherwell, Reed, Hass, and Forte were your top five. I think Holiday should be there too. I really think Holiday was better than the Hass I've eaten. Now next spring, just so you know, we'll be getting in uh, uh, quite a few more. One called Gilligly, which is not on this list, and I don't know much about it. Um, I think we're getting in Edinger, Adrenal. Pinkerton, more Pinkertons. I only have one Pinkerton out there right now. And a few others, I can't remember all the names. We have a list up at the registers. So those are coming in. Holiday is, is what I have at the moment. How does the Stewart write? Stewart? Stewart is a uh, Mexicola type. So the true Mexican avocados, which are real commonly grown north because they're more cold hardy, um, have a, most of them have a stronger flavor actually, which is some people really like. I don't think the oil content's quite up there, but Stewart, Mexicola, Mexicola Grande have a stronger, I don't know, some people say it's nutty, some people say it's anisey, licorice -y, but stronger flavor, but a real thin skin. Uh, most people on the Mexican varieties eat the skin. It's, it's just, you can't peel it off. It's really tight, and it's really thin and really soft, and it's purple. So Mexican avocados are glossy purple, kind of neat that way. So, and they ripen also earlier than Hass. So they ripen uh, November, December, generally. That's the Mexican types. I don't have any Mexican ones at the moment. Bacon is mostly Mexican. Uh, bacon's not bad. Uh, we might be getting some bacons again. How do you write Queen? Haven't eaten it yet. That's supposed to be really good. Queen was the only one, Queen and Char were the only ones we wanted to get next spring that we couldn't get. We have to uh, have these custom grafted and they give us uh, choices of which ones we can get. The only one we couldn't get was Queen that we really wanted and, and more Char -wills. So everything else that's highly rated is coming. Okay, good, good, good tip. Any other questions today? How close can you plant avocados? I know, like with the other pruning trees, you talk about putting three close to each other. How close can you do that with an avocado? Well, I did uh, three feet apart when I did my yard. I had three avocado trees between trunks was three feet, so they just grew together. 
Um, that probably messes up your, your production per square foot, though, just having grow together like that. But at least they were within a 10-foot area of my garden. I had three avocado trees. So it cuts down the production of each one a bit. So. You mentioned not uh, planting near citrus. Do you already have citrus in an area where you were going to plant it? You just spritz them with honey. Yeah. Then just the honey will do it. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, yeah, in my yard, there's more citrus than avocados, so nothing you can do when there's more citrus. You just have to make sure the avocado is more attractive. Yeah. Maybe you can get a hive. <laughs> yeah. um, can I ask about Carmen's size also? Uh, how big in comparison to others? Well, they're considering it a medium-sized tree, but just because it's if it's out going uh, if it's going to produce more than any other avocado tree, it's going to stay small. It won't it won't have the opportunity to grow that much. And we were there, at, they have one at the Great Park. So we planted one at the Great Park 12 years ago in their demonstration garden. They have a raised bed there. And I don't think they've ever, I haven't talked to them enough though. I don't know if they've ever pruned it. It's about 10 by 10. But we were there four years ago just counting fruit on one branch at the bottom had 50. We're going, okay, we're not counting this tree. There's too much fruit on this tree to count. <laughs> And the guys that work there, all the volunteers that work there have bought Carmen's from us. They said, this is an amazing tree. So, uh, Great Park in Irvine off of Sand Canyon, the demonstration garden. Oh, okay. Yeah. I have a question. My Mexicola, this is its, it's like two years, maybe two and a half years. And when, when I got it soon after it had blossoms, and everybody I knew said, here is the blossoms, don't let it grow. And now it's huge, it's its value, but it's huge, it has no blossoms. But what time of the year does it blossom? Should say on the list here. Oh, it doesn't have the bloom time? Yeah. Well, usually, I know bacon blooms uh, February through April. I think Mexicola blooms about the same time. So you should start seeing buds form soon. Yes. So after your pep talk on Forte, uh, I have a forte that's um, about five foot, maybe six foot tall. It's been there for four years. It's never produced at all. Should I just make firewood? So you, you see any flowers for them at all? Yeah, I actually have flowers right now. Well, then it's fine. You just have to make the bees like it better. Could you review your recommendations for uh, fertilizers? Again, I think you mentioned the, the phosphate, but you didn't talk about any others, I don't think. Well, a good... High nitrogen fertilizer for until the tree's about six foot or even eight foot if you want it bigger. And then you just back off. They don't need much fertilizer to fruit. If you leave the dead leaves on the ground, that's going to be 90% of what it needs. Just get the gypsum on there once in a while. I mean, you can put a little bit on there once in a while, but avocado trees don't need a lot of fertilizer to fruit. Um, it's minimal. And, they, and plus, on a mature tree that you're wanting to fruit, they say starve them till they finish blooming. Don't feed them uh, until they finish blooming. Because they said if you feed them too early, then they start growing new leaves and all the energy goes into the new growth instead of into the fruit. So, they, they, so essentially they say don't feed them till summer. You want to make sure the, the flowering is done with before you feed them, if you need to feed them at all. Again, if you just put a whole bunch of dead leaves on the ground, that's probably adequate. But if, when they're babies, you know, we're not worried about fruiting. We want them to get the foliage cover on them. I, I just put uh, the, the Osmo Hood up there. I just put the Osmo Coat on my six-month-old Carmen. Mm -hmm. Is that good enough for now? Good enough. I mean, this is a chemical fertilizer, and we use it here at the nursery primarily because most other fertilizers, we'd have to throw them in the pot every month to keep it going because in pots, everything flushes through too fast. This will give us six months of fertilizer, which is great for us. Um, it does have 11 of the 13 minerals that plants need, so it's a very, very complete uh, chemical fertilizer. But we know in the long run it's better to go organic. But again, as long as you have dead leaves on the ground, that's an organic source, and that'll keep the soil fluffy and alive. Um, now, I will mention, since Charles is a good friend of ours, he made this organic fertilizer that's, I don't know how he got it this concentrated. So organic fertilizers like this, this is typical where they, 
numbers, the percentages of the nutrition is in single digits. He's got one that's uh, organic, 13, 12, 13. I don't know how he got that stuff that concentrated in there. Um, yeah, this one you mix with water and you spray it out there or apply it to the ground. I haven't tried it. I haven't used it yet. I'm supposed to. I told him I would. But it's uh, feather meal, alfalfa meal, fish bone meal, kelp meal, cottonseed meal, potassium sulfate, glacial rock dust, neem cake, rock phosphate, oyster shell flour, and the list is actually about 100 words long <laughs> of things he's got in here. So it's... Uh, but uh, that, that's pretty amazing. It costs this about the same, though. This is uh, $29 for three quarters of a pound. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of expensive. Well, they come from a climate that's fairly wet, so you'd expect the soil to be acidic. Um, generally, no one worries about it much here because if you're, as long as you're feeding them organically, like dead leaves, the pH doesn't matter as much when you're feeding organically. If you're feeding chemically, then it matters because certain fertilizers, certain chemical fertilizers dissolve and are more available at certain pHs. But organic fertilizers are no, don't dissolve and they're just taken in directly through uh, fungus in the ground. So in that case, it's not as important. Yes. Well, the ideal thing is plant leaves, yeah. but if you don't have enough, anything is fine. Just watch, you know, the coarser it is, the thicker you can put it. If it's real fine textured stuff like grass clippings, don't go too deep because it can't, the air can't get through there. But uh, it got to the point, you know, psychologically you get, you get messed up, so you go, okay, I'm pruning my hedge. I better put all the leaves underneath my avocado tree. <laughs> you tend not to throw things away after you learn what nature wants. Uh, anything you prune, you just throw underneath the avocado tree. With that mycorrhizae, do you um, add that to the soil as well? Don't need to. It's there. Okay. So the mycorrhizal fungus, which is the recycler in nature for avocado trees, uh, unless you had a volcano blast in your backyard in the last few years, the mycorrhizal is there. So yeah, I talked to a researcher who went up to Mount St. Helens after it blasted to see how long it took the mycorrhizals to repopulate the area. It took five years, but that was like a 200 mile, square mile area. So unless you have something happen in your backyard real drastic, you shouldn't have to put the mycorrhizals back in. Now, in a pot, and if you use our potting soil, our top pot, which is what we grow ours in, then the mycorrhizals would help because this is, this, this is artificial. There's no mycorrhizal fungi in there. So this, I think this has mycorrhizals in it. Most of the Dr. Earth products have mycorrhizals in it. EB Stone, there's a lot of companies that put mycorrhizal fungi in there. Um, so you, it would be beneficial to add it, although you probably can just take a handful of dirt six inches deep from your garden and just throw it in there and that would have it. Okay, any other questions? I think I think we're pretty well. Yeah, you can do it. It is. We'll take questions after. Thank you.